So here's what we know about the future of energy, or at least what we're pretty sure about. First, we know that the population of the world continues to grow. The seven billionth person in the world was born towards the latter part of last year. It is the United Nations' best guess that by the year 2050, the world population is going to be, it will have passed nine billion. And by the year 2100, it's expected that the population of the world is going to be somewhere north of 10 billion. The other thing that we're pretty aware of is that per capita, we seem to be using more and more energy as the years roll on. Now there's some really good, good reasons for this that we should be happy about. Part of the good news here is that hundreds of millions of people are being pulled up from, from poverty and are leading healthier, longer, more productive lives. Unfortunately, a consequence of that is that per capita, they are using more energy than they used to. Now those two facts side by side, that is the fact that there's more of us and that per capita we're using more energy, each and every one of us. You put those two things together and this trend right up here, this is what you get. Now there's a lot of themes and things we could pull out of that figure, but I think the punchline goes something like this. In the future, we're gonna need more energy than we have needed in the past, lots more. On top of that, there's a growing body of evidence that our economic activities, usually without us intending it this way, our economic activities have affected the environment. And we have to be mindful of the fact that the pursuit of energy and how we use it uh, features prominently in that theme. So all these emerging themes, they help to frame some emerging truths about what we do not know about the future of energy. We do not know where all of that energy is going to come from. We have some high, uh, some, some high level ideas, but we certainly do not know the specifics. We do not know precisely where it's going to come from, nor do we know specifically how we're going to get it into the hands of the people who are asking for it. What is becoming increasingly in focus for us, however, is that this problem is so big, so huge in scope and scale, and will probably involve so much money and resources to solve, that there can be little doubt that, this, that there's any kind of silver bu bullet that is going to solve this for us. It is almost certainly not going to be something that is solvable just by the public sector or just by private industry. Almost certainly it's going to require contributions from each of these groups. And so it goes with our choice of speakers today. We have two speakers for you, one from industry and one from government. Each of them is going to speak for about 20 minutes, followed by about 10 minutes of question and answers. Our first speaker started his career with Shell in 1982, and he spent the ensuing 30 years, give or take, uh, working around the world in a broad range of technical and managerial roles. Now, he currently finds himself in the position of CEO of Aero Energy. Now, you may not know everything about Aero Energy, so here's a little bit of info. That's a 50-50 joint venture that's owned both by Royal Dutch Shell and PetroChina and it has grown over the last few years to become one of the largest integrated energy companies in Australia. I think you'll agree then that, that having Aero Energy along for this discussion is, is eminently sensible because they can look at this both with the perspective of Australia and also with, with the international perspective. So with that said, please welcome to the stage the CEO of Aero Energy, Mr. Andrew Faulkner. Thank you very much and uh, welcome. Thank you very much for having me to speak, Minister Ferguson, um, guests. Uh, the dilemma that Robert has articulated is a very, very real one and it's one that um, 
companies like my own and the two parents, um, Shell and PetroChina, have wrestled with and recognised over some years. And so indeed I'm keen to spend uh, the next 20 minutes just dwelling on, on that particular challenge, both at a global macro level as well as bringing it back to its relevance for Arrow Energy and for Australia and Queensland. And so over the next 20 minutes, I'd like to give that industry perspective. I do draw heavily on some of the work done by one of my parents, Shell, who are quite famous um, in the industry for their scenario planning, and I will draw heavily on some of that. I'll touch upon Arrow Energy uh, a little bit more than, than Robert's introduction, but more importantly, I'd like to spend some time indeed talking about that global goal of prosperity that Robert spoke of, and how we move from here to there, or how at least we, we try to wrestle that particular challenge to the ground. And whilst I'll talk about some of the technical side of things, the, the, the demand and the supply side of things, I do want to draw out that angle that, that Robert mentioned around social license to operate and the environment, because that is a very important defining factor in terms of how we uh, address or seek to address that particular challenge. And those, lo those factors, both at a, a global level and well a, as well as a local level, are hugely influential. And I know the minister referred to precisely that in his recent speech at the AFR conference a few days ago. So just a little um, publicity, if I might, uh, with respect to Arrow Energy. So Arrow Energy, as Robert mentioned, is a 50-50 joint venture. Uh, a private joint venture between uh, Shell, Royal Dutch Shell and PetroChina. It's one of the largest license holders within the state of Queensland, over 65,000 square kilometres. And it has an enormous amount of stakeholders, external stakeholders, whether they are landholders or communities or overlapping tenures with coal companies or the government and regulators. And it is an area that is extremely important to us and we recognise, and you'll hear it come through as a common theme in many of, watch, uh, of what I say. Arrow Energy is often referred to as the fourth coal seam gas to LNG project, um, which is probably a little unfair because it underplays Arrow's pioneering role in both coal seam gas development as a concept, as well as the domestic market, where Arrow is a 20% supplier to the Queensland gas and power market. And as you can see, we too are pursuing a, uh, an LNG project in addition to our existing domestic business. Uh, we're growing fast, so we were around 400 people a year and a half ago. We're now approaching 1,000. And we are making very good progress towards um, achieving a final investment decision on that LNG project uh, late next year. But enough about Arrow Energy and more about the challenge uh, that Robert has set us and the reason really we're here today. And has got, again, as Robert mentioned, the ultimate goal here is global prosperity. Um, and what is a fundamentally indisputable issue is that energy in all its forms is a key driver of um, achieving that goal of uh, future prospectivity. And so when you look at those there's a whole range of challenges that we have to uh, overcome, ensuring that it is both clean, efficient, affordable, reliable, and, that last word, sustainable. And so let's talk a little bit about demand. Um, it is indeed the, the driving upwards of that demand by the emerging economies with their rising populations and their desire for prosperity and to move to prosperity levels that are the blessing of, of many of us that is driving that increasing demand for energy. The population giants of Asia are still going through their most energy intensive growth curve. And this is a growth journey that will not last just a few years but many decades to come both the journeys of China, followed by the journeys of India, followed by the journeys of the likes of Indonesia and Vietnam. And so this is a many decade long, quite predictable when considered from historical norms, journey through uh, 
in the energy usage and, popular, uh, and population growth. And it's clearly good. It's good that we are bringing these people out of prosperity, out towards prosperity and the opportunity to live longer and more prospective lives. But unquestionably, that helps drive that tightness of the energy market. Urbanisation is another driving factor here. Currently 50% of people live in cities and that is estimated to grow to around 75% by 2050. And the challenges, the laudable challenges put upon the industry with respect to clean fuels and the environment clearly make it a challenge for conventional hydrocarbons and conventional energy to meet the sort of demand growth that we're seeing. And in fact, really we need to be looking beyond that in order to bridge the gap. So in essence, the conventional fuels, the conventional fossil fuels, be they oil or coal or natural gas, are important, and as you will see in a graph in a few slides time, will remain important, but the developing world and the world in whole needs a transition process as well. But fundamentally, at the heart of that transition process is the requirement that any future energy source, the cost of that is outweighed by the production end value. Or to put it in simple terms, there has got to be a commercial driver for it in some way, shape or form. And so at the moment, the renewable energies that we're seeing simply cannot meet both the whole demand and the cost requirements uh, articulated up there. And this is a, a very um, complicated, in a way, but very, very important slide that tries to capture a little bit about Robert, what the challenge Robert was articulating. So if you start down here, and if you were to take the historical patterns of energy usage associated with economic development, and you were to project them forward with that growth that we're seeing in those emerging economies, then by 2050, you would expect to see a three times increase in the existing energy demand of the world. However, it's not realistic to assume that that happens without any degree of efficiency gains or innovation. And so there is a logic to say that having got up to here, that ordinary demand moderation through innovation, through competitive tension, will bring the energy demand requirements of the world down by perhaps 20%. But nonetheless, a substantial increase in the energy demand requirements of the world. If we then look at the supply side of things, and we take into account geography and geology and the geopolitics of supply, then one can see and project forward perhaps a 50% increase in the existing production of energy production of the world. And I would note that even standing still is a challenge. So traditionally, um, oil and gas developments decline at around about 5% per year. So even the effort of standing still is quite considerable, let alone growing the current energy engine of the world by a further 50%. And if you then take those two pieces together, you end up in, with this zone of uncertainty. This zone of uncertainty that has to, because this is not a theoretical discussion, that has to be bridged by some means or the other. So this is a very real problem, and it's got to be bridged by either some extraordinary management of demand or equally some extraordinary management of supply. And perhaps another way of putting this is to talk about it as a zone of either extraordinary misery or opportunity. So for example, if one was to consider the demand side, that could either be managed in a well-targeted policy format and improved efficiency in transport of cities or power. Or conversely, it could be driven by price shocks 
knee-jerk policies and frustrated aspirations. And so in a way, the discussion and the challenge ahead of us is how we manage that problem rather than the problem doesn't exist. And just to try and address right up front a popular misconception that there is some brand new technology, some silver bullet just around the corner that's going to come and almost overnight help us close the gap. Unfortunately, history says that that is extremely unlikely. So this slide, um, produced by two Shell gentlemen uh, a couple of years ago, tracks the performance, the development performance of existing new um, conventional and unconventional energy sources. And to be drawn from this is the fact that the time scales we are talking about are huge. The energy system is vast, with huge amounts of capital stock and lifetimes of projects that are measured in the decades. And what you can see from this, this um, slide is just how many decades it takes for a new energy technology to move from being a bench mark, a bench or a pilot or a demonstrator to a material component of the world's energy mix. And in this case, that, that sort of, you can hardly see it, slight line across at, at around um, 10 to 6 and 10 to the 7th is around about only 1 or 2 percent. And they found that on average, for all of those conventional and unconventionals, it takes in the order of 30 years for something to move from a demonstrator level to a level where even if it's a 1 or 2 percent contributor to the world energy mix. And so with those sort of time scales, effectively, give or take, we know what's going to be contributing to the world's energy challenges in the years 2030, 2040. And it is within that group that we need to start addressing this problem rather than hoping that something else is going to come along. So let's talk about that energy mix, <coughs> which is actually an analysis of Robert's slide. And there are two things to be drawn. Firstly, on the left-hand side, you can see the increasing um, predominance, both in absolute and proportionality terms, of natural gas in the energy mix. You can also see that traditional hydrocarbons, including gas, will continue to play a very large portion of in it meeting the world energy supply even as far out as 2030, 2040. Albeit that proportionally they might come down a little bit. The second plot just shows one of the challenges around bringing forward a new technology. And that is its competitive economics, its competitive commercial. And so that plot shows the comparative capital and total costs of energy production using a variety of, of different sources. And again, you can see it, how much it emphasises the competitiveness of gas over some of the other forms. So that's the challenge we have at a global level. One of the greatest opportunities, if you've seen it associated with that, is the predominance of gas over the world and the predominance of both conventional and unconventional gas not least coal seam gas here in Australia, and in particular here in Brisbane, and uh, here in Queensland. And as you can see from the simple statistics up in the top left-hand corner, the ability and the um, abundance of coal seam gas offers an enormous potential for both Australia and, of course, in the form of LNG contributions to the world's global energy challenge. And there is a bit of a misconception, partially I, I hopefully addressed it at the start, that coal seam gas is something brand new, something just arriving, something uncertain or unproven. Coal seam gas has been around for a number of decades. Coal seam gas supplies 90% of Queensland's gas and power needs and around 20% of all of Australia's needs, and it does that already. And it does that, as you can see with some of those figures, by being a major contributor and a major employer 
and I would argue without having had a material impact on the environment. But that last point is the very important one because it is that growing challenge, the growing sensitivity with a growing demand that needs such careful management. And with a narrow energy, it's an area that is very high on our radar screen, top right-hand corner of the risk matrix in terms of the management of that social license to operate. And let me just talk about that a, a little bit. And if I might quote Pierre Lassonde, who is the former president of Newmont Mining Corporation. And it was Pierre who said, you don't get your social license by going to a government <coughs> ministry and making an application or simply paying a fee. It requires far more than money to truly become part of the, the communities within which you operate. And that is indeed the challenge that we face. Coal seam gas has the unique um, concept of being a large footprint in, in its broadest sense. And so, of course, with our 200,000 Arrow external stakeholders, we have quite a job in order to manage those. And whilst one can talk about managing them through partnerships or sponsorships or housing or infrastructure in addition to the direct employment side of things, really it's much more than that. It's much more around the behavioural side of things. It's around the management of the stakeholders via respect. It's about transparency. It's about listening. It's about doing what you say you will do. And this is a challenge that Arrow Energy is stepping up to. It's one that the industry has had some difficult times in the past, and it's one we absolutely recognise as something we have to solve if we're going to be successful going forward. And some of those particular challenges that we need to address, the things forefront in the minds of our external stakeholders, groundwater, salt, and the need for coexistence of what is an energy source with something as important to Brisbane as, for example, the agricultural community. And whilst I'll deal on the, the groundwater and salt in a moment, just on that subject of coexistence and agriculture, we are working extremely hard, especially out in the Surat area, in terms of demonstrating, so words are fine, demonstrating our ability to coexist with agriculture, both by demonstration of the tiny footprint associated with the actual active components of a coal seam gas facility or a well, which is not much bigger than the sort of size of the stage that I'm standing on, via pitless drilling at trials, um, washdown units, as well as, uh, in the near future, hopefully, some uh, indicative pad, trialing, uh, pad drilling trials within the um, intensively farmed land. And we have our own land access rules, blindingly obvious, but drive home to our staff and our contractors of the fundamental need to respect and liaise with the uh, community and the people on whose land we are operating. And those rules are sacrosanct, and contractors and staff who choose not to work, apply to those don't work for our anymore. And so let's just deepen that subject of external stakeholder management, if I, uh, if I might. So we do a lot. We spend a lot of time and a lot of energy engaging with the communities in order to un help them understand and to listen to their concerns around the coal seam gas industry. But we don't do enough, and we don't do it well enough, and that is the journey that we're on as a company in terms of strengthening our ability to engage with the communities. Because fundamentally, we are doing 30 and 40 year projects in these areas, and we have to become a good neighbour. We don't have to become that industry over there, we have to be part of the neighbourhood. And you're only going to get that through continuous engagement and continuous performance and continuous transparency. The top five issues, just to tackle some of those, because they're often heard and they'll often be reported in the newspaper. One is around produce water. So what the coal seam gas companies do is draw water from saline aquifers, so not sweet water aquifers, and we treat it and then we dispose of it in some way. And Arrow's method of disposal is one called substitution of allocation, whereby we provide sweet water, sweetened water through treatment to farmers, and in return, 
they no longer draw from the sweet aquifers of the Greater Artesian Basin. And we see that as a, as a real benefit for the Greater Artesian Basin. The sort of volumes that we're talking about, as you can see there, uh, 25 gigalitres a year. Large volumes, very valuable volumes, but relatively small compared to what is already drawn out from um, the farm in industry, as well as something like 200 gigalitres a year that are lost through uncapped bores and un unlined drains. So there's a tremendous opportunity uh, there. And of course, something that we do do, maybe not in the last year or two, is we go a long way to helping communities like the Dolby area to be drought proof. So we provide tremendous employment opportunities at a regional level, as well as the potential for drought proofing some of these areas in the tougher times. From the salt side of things, our commitment has always been that we will remove salt. Um, we will remove salt and, and we will find some commercial solution um, that benefits um, the broader community. Strategic cropping land is a very sensitive subject. It's around about 15% of Arrow's tenures. It's important to us, um, and it's clearly a subject that we need to get right. But we are getting that right. If you look at the land access agreements there, we have a large number of land access agreements. It would be worth me highlighting that we have no land access agreements or no, no, nothing in land court. So our belief is that we come to agreements with farmers to enable, enable us to continue our activities on their land, and to date we have been very successful on that. And I think the last point I'd like to make, because it's a very popular word, uh, it was that wonderful word of fracking. Um, so first and foremost, Arrow does almost no fracking. We are fortuitous in that, so the little fracking that we do is up, way up north in the Bowen Basin. We do no fracking in the Surat Basin and we have no plans, no, let me be more explicit, we will not be fracking in the Surat Basin on our existing LNG um, project tenures. So really, I think coal seam gas has an enormously important role to play in that huge dilemma that Robert portrayed at the front. I think the coal seam gas industry and Arrow Energy are going to step up to that. I think the companies that are at the forefront of that challenge are responsible um, global energy citizens and recognise their needs. And they recognise that whilst they bring enormous benefit to Queensland via um, revenues, as well as um, employment, as well as um, environmental standards, we have more to do. And so some of the big challenges associated with closing the gap that we've spoken of is how we manage that external stakeholder. So in summary, we have a real challenge. The world has a challenge. Industry has a challenge. Our own energy has a challenge. We have to find a way of providing clean, efficient, affordable, reliable and sustainable sources of energy. And that's a transitional journey. I'm not sure what 2080 looks like, but I am pretty sure what 2030, 2040 and 2050 look like. And that transitional journey is a big journey that requires a lot of effort both from industry and, and from government, which you will hear shortly. And so that transition process is something that we all need to step up to. And so I see coal seam gas as playing a fundamental part within that. But we have to address that in-between transitional challenge of demonstrating our, our um, environmental credibility, our credentials, and, and our transparency. And it's something that I think Arrow Energy will play a very important part in. Thank you. Our next speaker uh, was first elected to the Australian Federal Parliament in 1996. And in that same year, he was uh, appointed a member of the Order of Australia. Apparently a busy year for him. Now he's uh, both the Australian Commonwealth Minister for Resources and Energy and also the Minister for Tourism. Please welcome to the lectern the Honorable Martin Ferguson. Well, thanks very much, Robert, Andrew, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome the opportunity to actually address you today on the all-important question of the future of energy. 
In doing so, can I indicate that two days ago here in Brisbane, I actually spoke about the development of Australia's energy and resource sectors during this period of change. Today, I want to focus more on the challenges facing us globally and the opportunities this presents us as a nation, obviously of the utmost importance to Queensland in the decades ahead. I express my appreciation to QUT and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for giving me a chance to address you this morning. The foundation was started because Bill and Melinda Gates appropriately believed that every person should have the chance to live a healthy, productive life. This is something I too very much believe in and work towards. In the context of the future of energy, this means seeking to deliver a reliable supply of energy, so fundamental to health, education, improving the standard of living of the world's people. It's actually about lifting people out of poverty. In Australia, where we have access to a reliable supply of energy, it is easy for us to take these things for granted, and we have been able to do so for decade after decade. We tend to think about its cost more than its presence. But a reliable supply of energy is fundamental to economic growth. And economic growth is fundamental to improving people's lives. Energy creates wealth and jobs and the means to lift people out of poverty. Looking to the future globally, one of the best insights we have is provided by the International Energy Agency. I was fortunate to chair the IEA's ministerial meeting in October 2011 attended by energy ministers representing over three quarters of the world's energy consumption. Central to the discussions was the challenge of meeting the world's growing demand for energy while seeking to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions. That is, delivering a secure and sustainable supply of energy globally. And I say that because there is no doubt the world's demand for energy is growing rapidly as represented by the earlier slides. In its 2011 World Energy Outlook, the IAA predicts that if countries implement the new policies they've announced, global energy demand will increase, increase by 40% by 2035. 90% of this projected demand comes from non-OECD countries. China is set to account for more than 30% of this forecast growth alone. As a result, China is expected to become the world's largest energy user, consuming 70% more energy than the US, which will be the second largest consumer by 2035. Even so, per capita consumption in China will remain less than half that of the US. Looking to India, it is forecast to account for another 15% of demand growth and fueling this insatiable demand will require all energy sources. Accordingly, demand for natural gas is expected to experience the biggest increase, up by more than 40%, coal by around 25%, and oil increasing by 18% to 2035. To meet this, the world will be required to invest an average of 1.5 trillion a year, two thirds of it in non-OECD countries. About 17 trillion will be needed in the electricity sector alone, and a further 20 trillion in the oil and gas sectors combined. Ladies and gentlemen, it's important to look at why this demand is occurring. It is in essence being driven by population growth, urbanization, and economic development. According to the UN, World population will grow from today's 7 billion to 8.6 billion by 2035. Within this, urban populations are expected to grow from 3.5 billion to more than 5 billion, driving a 20% increase in energy consumption per capita. This is because urban incomes are higher than rural incomes and wealthier consumers buy more energy consuming appliances and vehicles. In short, over the next 25 years, the world will have 23% more people and the average person will consume 20% more energy than they do today. The provision of energy to people who currently don't have it will therefore play a major role in poverty reduction over the next 25 years. The World's Health Organisation estimates that about 3 billion people cook and heat their homes using open fires and leaky stoves burning biomass. With a lack of access to clean burning fuels, 
About 2 million people a year die prematurely from indoor air pollution. And amongst all these people, most of these people in sub-Saharan Africa or developing Asia. While increasing demand brings with it substantial challenges in terms of addressing climate change, we must also recognise that energy is vital to lifting people out of poverty and improving their standard of living, something any decent society like Australia would aspire to. Access to clean energy is as much about improving people's health as it is about improving the environment. What then of Australia's role in this global context? I believe Australia has two key roles to play. Firstly, as an energy exporter to assist in meeting glo growing global energy demand. Secondly, and I think this is exceptionally important, as a world leader in research and development of energy efficient and clean energy technologies. That is where I believe Australia's so-called green jobs will actually come from. Looking firstly to Australia's role as an energy exporter. Australia, we should never forget, is only one of three OECD countries that are next net energy exporters, Norway and Canada being the others. And Australia's location in Asia means that we are exceptionally well placed to supply the growing markets of the rising giants. That's what the Asian century debate in Canberra is actually about. By way of reference, Australia's energy exports have risen from 24 billion in 2007 to more than 70 billion today and growing. In addition, Australia continues to be the world's largest coal exporter, accounting for one quarter of total world coal exports. And with 231 billion of investment committed and underway in advanced energy and mineral projects at this point in time, over 70% 70, 70 of which are energy related, this trend obviously looks to continue. Gas makes up a big proportion of this investment, 170 billion and growing, is, and is the next big energy export opportunity for Australia. LNG exports are around 10 billion a year and are expected to increase. In essence, 20 million tonnes per year are currently exported from Australia at the moment. More than 140 billion capex has been committed since 2007, 45 billion of which has been in Queensland over the last two years, in major new LNG projects that will quadruple Australia's LNG exports. Our export capacity has been lifted by 50 million tonnes to put us on par with Qatar as one of the world's largest LNG exporters by 2015-16. In the next few years, the IEA projects that Australia will become the second largest exporter of LNG. But interestingly, by 2035, we are potentially the eighth largest producer of gas. We have had a window opportunity and we have grabbed it as a nation. A key component of this growth is the development of our coal seam gas fields. As in the United States with shale gas, CSG faces challenges in Australia in engaging with local communities and earning their trust, as has been touched on this morning. CSG has to ensure hydraulic fracturing processes and the associated issues around chemicals and water are conducted to the highest possible standards. I remind you that primary regulatory responsibility rests with state and territory governments, but the Australian government is keen to work with states to resolve these issues. Accordingly, my department and I are working collaboratively with state counterparts and with companies to develop nationwide best practice frameworks for this industry. I appreciate the support given to date by state and territory governments in this regard. We all recognise it's important that we build community confidence going forward and maintain our all-important social licence to operate. The development of the East Coast gas fields also has implications for Australia's domestic gas markets. In terms of Australia's generation, currently coal-fired electricity generation counts for 75% of generation today, while gas holds a 15% share. By the middle of the century, it's suggested that gas could account for 44% of generation. Historically, domestic and export markets for gas have been separated. 
Increasingly though, international demand for LNG is placing pressure on domestic gas prices, causing prices to trend towards international levels. Where international prices go, however, is a moot point. I recognise that new investment in LNG processing plants in Queensland will have benefits for domestic markets such as diversification of supply, innovation infrastructure investment and new job opportunities. I might also remind you that in terms of future revenue for the whole community of Queensland, these projects in a decade's time, in accordance with the way the PWRT tax regime operates, are going to be exceptionally important for the government to be able to fund fundamental activities such as health and education as a few examples with a growing community. But as I have said before, domestic gas availability is an issue on which governments at all levels must maintain a watching brief. I simply encourage gas producers to engage with customers and governments to ensure that we can all collectively work through this period of transition in Australia's gas markets and avoid difficulties down the track. The draft white paper which was released in December starts this discussion and very much it's very topical at this point in time. Looking now at the other area I see as a competitive strength for Australia in the global energy supply chain, the all important question of technology and innovation. Globally, the world is looking for technologies to address the challenge of climate change. Australia is exceptionally well placed to participate in the global race to develop new technologies that are clean, reliable and cost effective. And that is the primary objective. Clean, reliable and cost effective. Australia boasts world class research institutions specialising in the development of innovative renewable and clean energy technologies such as solar. This includes ANU's Sliver Solar Cell Technology, UNSW's Pluto Technology and SIRO's Red Flow Battery Technology by way of examples. Just last week, I announced a further 12 million in support through the Australian Solar Institute to research and develop innovative solar concentrating technologies. And with world-class research institutes, importantly comes world-class researchers. Australia has a very talented base when it comes to our scientists, engineers and researchers. We need to, fo we need to focus our efforts on our competitive advantages when it comes to developing technologies. That is education, research and licensing of our homegrown technologies. To do this, the government has put in place a comprehensive framework to support our clean energy technology development and in turn its deployment. Obviously part of this is the carbon price which comes into effect from the 1st of July, side by side with the renewable energy target of 20% by 2020. Importantly, the Clean Energy Future Package will see the establishment of the Australian Renewable Energy Agency with effect from the 1st of July of this year and the 10 billion Clean Energy Finance Corporation from the 1st of July next year. Arena for which I have responsibility will manage 3.2 billion in funding to support the research and development, demonstration, commercialisation and deployment of renewable energy. But part of this debate must also mean an appropriate focus on energy efficiency. Objective being to develop innovative technologies and methods to reduce our energy use. I'm talking about what is often referred to as the elephant in the room, energy efficiency. The IEA has identified energy efficiency, particularly in the near term, as the most cost effective option to reduce global emissions. And in terms of targeting energy efficiency, the biggest savings can actually be made by industry. This is because over 80% of Australia's electricity consumption is from our commercial and industrial sector, with households making up the remainder. If we are serious about improving energy efficiency in Australia, the big gains must therefore be made in the industrial sector. Can I also remind you that from a company's point of view, this is actually smart in terms of actual running your bottom line. The Australian Government Energy Efficiency Opportunities Program is obviously designed to help companies to actually adjust in this context. The EEO is about building industry capability to get smarter and do more with less energy 
as we've actually achieved in terms of using less water over the last decade confronted by a drought. The Ledgley program requires Australia's largest energy using companies to undertake rigorous energy assessments. The program covers companies representing approximately 30% of Australia's total energy use. Business participating in the program identified opportunities to save nearly 10% of their energy use, which is equivalent to an esti estimated 2.5% of Australia's total energy use. To further support industry efforts and disseminate case studies on how these savings can be achieved, today I am pleased to announce the launch of the Energy Efficiency Exchange website. The website found at wexgov.au, as seen behind me, was developed by my department in conjunction with the state and territory governments through the National Strategy on Energy Efficiency. It is designed to save business time and money, provide providing industry with a comprehensive, up-to-date quality information on energy efficiency in one central location. The website has information on a range of energy efficiency opportunities across different sectors and technologies. It draws on company experience through the EEO program and best practice information locally and overseas. Information on business support programs such as the government's Clean Energy Future Plan is also a key element of the site. I'm hopeful that this information will help Australian businesses to adopt new energy efficient technologies and to process and process to ensure their competitiveness in the future. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, can I say that globally we face the challenge of seeking to improve the living standards of the world's population, which brings with it the associated need to meet growing demand for energy with minimal impact on the environment. Australia is well placed to play a key role globally in helping to meet this challenge, both through the export of our energy resources and our innovative clean energy technologies and IP. To ensure Australia can meet these future challenges, the government has set in place a transparent market-based policy framework. This includes ensuring we can deliver Australia's huge investment pipeline to supply our exports to market efficiently and remain a reliable supplier of energy products. Through the Clean Energy Future Plan, the government is also putting in place a framework to promote Australia's capacity and to encourage innovative outcomes in terms of clean energy technology. With the development of this suite of measures, I am confident that the government and Australian industry can work in partnership in association with research institutions such as QUT to respond to the energy supply and demand challenges we face. I thank you for the opportunity to address this very important topical issue at this point in time. All right, that concludes our program today. So on behalf of the Queensland University of Technology and the Gates Cambridge Scholarship, thank you very much for coming and goodbye. <laughs>